All right. Hey, good morning, church. Great to be with you guys today and all of our campuses joining us right now. Uh, we have a wonderful day planned as we dive in. And can I just tell you, church, it is, man, isn't it awesome to just come together as the church? Uh, it, it is a good thing to be together. I know all of our campuses feel the same way, those joining us online. And let me just tell you, the, one of the honors of my life is to pastor a three-circle church. I was just thinking this morning, the unbelievable opportunity and honor it is to stand on the stage. And if you're new with us, or maybe you've just been coming a few weeks, or maybe you kind of started with us in the new year, we just want you to know, we, we understand it's a big church with multiple locations, but at the end of the day, man, we are a group of people that really want to have not only gospel doctrine and theology, but also gospel culture, where we come together and we love each other, we care about each other. We're real people. I promise you, you're sitting in chairs, whatever campus you're at, next to people who didn't get it all right this week. Like, they're tired just like you are. They had a hard time getting up and getting to church just like you did today. Here's another little thing. Everyone's not even happy to be here because we're just humans, but we're here. And here's the beautiful thing about the body of Christ when we get together. We come together and we are encouraged just by virtue of being in the same space and breathing the same air or in a digital environment. Many of you could not get out today. Uh, maybe you're sick. Maybe you're dealing with Omicron or something like that. Or maybe the weather was bad where you were. You're joining us online. Even being in a digital space together with other believers becomes an encouragement to us. So I am grateful for this Lord's day that we come together and open God's word. Amen, church? So we do that together now. If you have your Bibles, you can go to 1 Kings. We're in our Elijah series. We're looking at one of the most epic characters and epic lives in the Bible. But our primary goal is not to learn about Elijah. Our primary goal is to learn about God through Elijah's life. That's the deal. The spotlight is on God, not Elijah. But we have to learn about Elijah and his life to understand what God is teaching us about himself. Now, the context of Elijah's life, this famous guy in the Bible, is that, remember, just a quick recap, uh, King Ahab is the king over Israel at this time, and he's basically the worst king Israel's ever had. And, and to make matters worse, he has married a woman who was part of the royal family of a, of a city and a small kingdom called Sidon. And her name is Jezebel. Now, Jezebel does not believe in the living God, and Ahab barely does, and he's being led by the nose by his new wife. And Jezebel comes from Sidon, and Sidon happened to be the capital of Baal worship. And Baal was a false god, and he was considered by the Baal worshipers to be the most powerful of many gods. So they were, they were uh, 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 basically believed in many gods, okay? Not just one. They were not monotheistic. They were polytheistic. But their number one God was this God called Baal. He supposedly could raise the dead. He supposedly could uh, work miracles. And he supposedly would take care of people and, and, and make sure that it rained and made sure the crops grew. So they worshiped Baal. So when Jezebel married Ahab, she comes in. she got a strong personality. Ahab's kind of like, man, whatever, man, you know. And Jezebel shows up and she's like, I got a whatever for you. You're going to do what I tell you to do. And, and he does. And she says, number one, we're going to worship Baal now, not not this other God that you Israelites have worshiped. And he's like, okay. And then she says, and we're going to kill all the prophets of the God that you guys supposedly have served. And so she begins a murderous uh, campaign against anyone connected with the living God. And in the middle of all of that, there's a man who shows up from Tishbe, which we don't even know where that is. He shows up and his name's Elijah and he walks into the palace and tells them, here's the deal. There's only one God, not many, and the one living God is not the one that you serve, this false pop prophet Baal. And Elijah says, and here's what's about to happen. The thing that you need the most, the rain to make your crops grow, to, to give the land food, it's going to stop. I'm about to shut the heavens up and they will not open back up until I tell them to. And he walks out. That's pretty, hey, that's a, that's a mic drop moment, right? And we learned in that one opening verse last week so much about Elijah, what he believed about God, his theology, what he understood about himself, that he was just a servant. He didn't even introduce himself to him. He didn't make it about him. And we learned about prayer last week. Elijah taught us so much about what he believed about how to pray to this living God. And so today we're going to continue his story and we're going to see what happens next in 1 Kings 17, 2 through 5. So after he did that, after he drops that bomb on Ahab and Jezebel, risking his life, he walks out of the palace and the Bible says, and the word of the Lord came to Elijah. 
and said, Depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Sherith, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went. Now watch this. God tells him to do something, and the next thing you see is something important about Elijah. Verse 5. So he went. Notice that? God said, you go. Here's where you go. I'm not giving you a lot of uh, explanation. In fact, it's kind of crazy what I just told you. You're going to drink out of a brook, and you're going to have birds feed you. We'll get into that in a moment more. But what you see is obedience. Verse 5. So he went and did. Watch this according to the word of the Lord, not according to what he wanted, not according to what he expected, not according to what would have been comfortable for him. He did what God told him to do according to the word of the Lord. So he went and he lived by the brook Sherith, that is east of the Jordan. Now we're learning more about Elijah. Remember, we want to adopt the things we observe in Elijah's life. And here's another one. Last week, we want to adopt his theology. One living God, who's the living God, alive, vibrant in our lives. <clears throat> but secondly, we want to adopt his prayer life, the way he prayed. Today, what we're going to learn is we need to adopt his obedience. We need to obey the way Elijah obeyed. And so the first thing I want you to see here is that Elijah simply obeyed God and trusted him with outcomes and provision. <clears throat> and you have to excuse me because I'm going to be coughing all day long. And uh, I'm sorry about that. But that's why God gave us water, another thing to glorify God with today, right? And cough drops, which I don't have one right now, so I can only glorify him about the water. Later, though, I'm going to find a cough drop, and I will glorify him for that too, my friends. Elijah obeyed God and trusted him with outcomes and with provision. He didn't know what it was going to look like, but he trusted what God said. God said, if you do what I'm telling you to do, I will provide for you. You will have what you need. 1 Samuel 15, 22 tells us what God thinks about obedience. And today, that's what today's all about. <clears throat> Week two of the Elijah series is all about obedience. In 1 Samuel 15, 22, the Bible says this, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. So in the Old Testament, what God was saying was, hey, I want you to do the sacrifices that I've told you to do, and I want you to do them the way I've told you to do them, but that is to be just a symbolic thing that's basically symbolic of what you really do, and that is obedience. What God's saying is, don't do sacrifices and go to church and sing the songs if you don't obey him. Like, all of those other things should simply be overflow from the fact that you obey God. So obedience is absolutely crucial. Obedience is absolutely a must. So he goes. He goes to the brook, and look what it says in 1 Kings 17 and 6. One of the coolest things in the Bible, I think. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, which means sausage biscuits, <clears throat> and bread and meat in the evening, which means uh, meatball subs. Okay, that's, that's what we're going to get. We're going to get breakfast and uh, dinner. And he drank from the brook. So this is amazing. Let me tell you what's interesting about this. Let's talk about these ravens for a minute. So Elijah gets fed by ravens. Now let me tell you why that's interesting. Because the book of Deuteronomy tells us that ravens are unclean birds. In the Bible, ravens are unclean. You know what ravens were? They were basically like our buzzards. They were smaller versions of our buzzards. You know what a buzzard is, right? A buzzard let you know when there's something gross and nasty on the road because they're eating it. And when you ride by and you're disgusted, they're looking at you like, what's the problem? You don't want to mess with a buzzard. They're dirty birds. And yet, the dirty bird of the Bible <clears throat> is who God uses to take care <coughs> excuse me, of Elijah. It is a dirty bird. It's not what he would have expected. Now, what is God teaching Elijah and us? What can we learn about God through this? Watch this. God's provision for us when we are obedient to him is unstoppable and also almost impossible to predict how he'll do it. 
He will blow your mind the way he can provide for you. He will provide for you in ways you never saw coming. Elijah, even look, this artistic rendering, look at Elijah. Elijah's like, it's a buzzard bringing me food. Look at his face. He's like, ah, what? why? Why a raven? They're unclean. And then he realizes, you know what? These sausage biscuits are pretty good these guys are bringing. And they show up on time every day. And what's God doing? God's looking at Elijah and saying, hey, I want you to know, because Elijah is going to face even harder things. It's not going to be long until Elijah is going to stand on top of a mountain against 400 prophets of Baal. And in that moment, when Elijah steps up and calls down fire out of heaven, he's going to have to remember that the same God who fed him with ravens is the same God who's going to show up on that mountain. And see, the reason we need to obey God in the small things, the little things like going and hanging out by the river the way God told Elijah to. The reason that had to happen was so that Mount Carmel, which we're going to learn about in a few weeks, could happen. In a few weeks, Elijah is going to have that apex moment of his ministry where he stands on top of a mountain and works one of the greatest miracles of the Bible. Fire comes down out of heaven. But but to trust God for that, he had to learn to trust God in the little things that no one else could see. By the way, no one else saw this. He's going to have a public ministry moment in a few weeks, but he had to have a private one first. See, before he could trust God publicly with everybody watching, God made sure he learned how to trust him all by himself, by the river. See, if Elijah would have balked at obeying God here, he would have never been able to pull off what we're going to learn that he does in a few weeks. And see, that's true in our lives. Some of us may wonder why God doesn't do big things in our lives. Because we're not faithful in the small. Because we've not learned how to obey him in the small things. <clears throat> the reason God can't open big doors for you, the reason God can't trust you with big things is because you've not proven you can go sit by a creek for, a, for six months and trust him that he can provide for you there. Every day when Elijah would get hungry in the evening and he's like, you know what, it's about that time. All of a sudden, here they come, the ravens. And he learned day by day, you know what, God is going to be faithful to me. God is going to show up. How many of you in your time walking with God have learned that God is going to be faithful? Like he's proven it to you. You, you, You've begun to relax a little bit because you've begun to go, you know what, he's going to be faithful to me. He's actually going to take care of me the way he promised he would. Another thing I want you to notice about Elijah is that he obeyed immediately. The Bible does not say he thought about it. The Bible does not say he uh, argued with God. God said, "Here and, and listen, just read the Bible slowly. <clears throat> Number one, he goes to the palace and he has an audience with the king and the queen and they could have killed him on the spot. And before he can even catch his breath, God says, okay, now that you did this big public thing, we're going private again. And I need you to go out in the middle of nowhere and I need you to sit by this creek and hide there. Wow. What is God doing? Well, he's teaching Elijah. He's working in Elijah's life. We've talked about that, this here at Three Circles. It's very important that we understand there's a public and a private side to our lives, and there must be alignment between the two. God wants alignment between the two. Elijah looks big and bad and brave and courageous when he steps onto the scene. But is he really that? Have you ever wondered when you see people on a stage or when you see people, you wonder, are they really that person? Are they really that, that guy? Well, we see with Elijah, he is. The same guy who trusts God in front of the king and the queen also trusts God next to the creek, next to the water. This is very, very important for us to understand. He obeyed immediately. Now, here's what happens around my house sometimes. I will tell my kids, clean your room. And they don't clean the room. And maybe the next day I remind them, clean the room. And then three, four days later, Sometimes one of my kids will totally clean their room and will come out proud of it. Like walk out of their room like, hey, 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 look what I did, Dad. Even maybe looking for a reward. Hey, Dad, room's clean. Going to give me a little money? Maybe I uh, got a little something for me? And, and you parents know what I'm talking about, right? Have you ever looked at your kids and, and, and you went, when did I ask you to do it? Uh, Sunday. What day is it today? Uh, Thursday. That's not obedience. Come on, can I get an amen in the room? I know I sound like an old guy right now. (laughs) That's not obedience. Delayed obedience is not obedience at all. So we learn something else about what God expects from us. 
God provides for Elijah in a spectacular way. But Elijah unlocked that provision by obeying in a spectacular way. And it was immediate. It was, God, I don't know why you're taking, taking me to this creek. And I don't know why you're telling me to do it. And I have no idea how you're going to pull this off. But you tell me to go and I'll go. That's what Elijah has decided in his life. How many of you, don't raise your hand, but rhetorically in your own heart, how many of you have put a yes card on the table to God? Because somewhere along the line, Elijah had. Somewhere along the line, Elijah said to God, whatever you tell me to do, I will do it. And it doesn't even have to make sense. And you don't even have to show me how you're going to make it all happen. If you say go, I go. You say stop, I stop. You say speak, I speak. Whatever you tell me to do, I'll do it. Church, we need that spirit of Elijah in our lives. We need that in our lives. We need to obey him immediately. 1 Kings 17, 7 through 10 tells us what happens next. So he's drinking from the brook every day, exactly like God said. The ravens are showing up, dropping off meat and and bread for him every day, everything he needs. And then this happens. After a while, the brook dried up. Why did it dry up? Because there was no rain in the land. Now don't forget why there's no rain in the land, church. Why is there no rain in the land? Because Elijah prayed that there would be no rain. Don't miss this. Elijah is being impacted by the same famine that everyone else is. See, we live in a world that's under the curse in many ways. And when our world goes through things, through judgment and those things, we feel it too, don't we? But in the middle of us going through it with everyone, we get to go through it with God. It's not that we don't feel it. It's not that we don't see the results of it as well. But we do so with God's help. So the, the creek dries up because, of course, there is no rain. And you see it happening there, right? And so the word of the Lord came to him again. Notice Elijah doesn't move until God speaks. Now you go, well, that's easy for Elijah. God's talking to him. Do you understand that you have far more interaction with God than Elijah ever could because you have this? Elijah didn't have this in his hands. Why is God talking to him all the time? Because he doesn't have this. He does not have the word of God available. You and I have the entire word of God, the full counsel of the word of God at our fingertips. On your phone, you probably have multiple copies in your home. We have something Elijah did not have. So Elijah, when he hears God's word, so I would ask you, when you read God's word, do you obey? Do you wait to see what God wants you to do? Well, Elijah did, and it dries up, so God speaks to him, and he says, arise and go to Zarephath. Watch this. Don't miss this. Maybe you've heard of Elijah's story. How many of you remember when he goes and meets the widow? If you grew up in church, remember the widow. And you remember he's going to work a miracle. We're about to read about it. But did you know where it was? Watch. God says, you arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to, everyone say it out loud. And what is Sidon? The capital of Baal worship. Literally, he's now saying, you're going to go to the epicenter of this false god worship. You're going to go to where Jezebel's from. You're going to Jezebel's hometown. Jezebel, the woman that's going to try to have you killed. Jezebel, the woman that's turned Israel against me and towards this false god. I am now going to send you my prophet. You have shown me you will obey me. I am now sending you into the teeth of the tiger. You are going to Sidon, an unbelievable thing. And he said, and you're going to live there, dwell there, stay there. And watch this. And behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. Now, what do we see in Elijah's life? Immediate obedience. So he arose and he went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, bring me a little water and a vessel that I may drink. Now, I just love this. First of all, don't miss the fact that God says, you go to Zarephath, which is in Sidon. You you do know that Elijah knew exactly what that meant. He's like, wait a minute, you're telling me to go where this all started? What is God doing here? Don't miss this. God is putting Elijah on display. Now that he has prepared Elijah in private, he's about to platform him publicly. And you know the problem in the church world sometimes is we platform ourselves publicly before we've allowed God to strengthen and train us privately. Does that make sense? When you see ministries fall apart, often it's because there was someone who got platformed publicly before God ever built them privately. 
Elijah was built privately. How many of you know God was learn, uh, Elijah was learning to trust God when those ravens were showing up every day? How strong do you think he became in his faith when every day God did exactly what he said he would do? And when that time came, when that brook dried up, God said, now you are ready. You are ready for public ministry because you have trusted me privately. So God sends him to Sidon. And the thing we understand now is we see Elijah now obey God for the third time explicitly. And this is now we can say that he does not only obey immediately, he obeys, write it down, consistently. Another thing we learn from Elijah is Elijah doesn't just obey God once. He always obeys and it becomes a pattern in his life. God says, you go talk to Jezebel and Ahab, he does. God says, now you go hide by a creek, he does. All of this is crazy. Going to Ahab and Jezebel, that's risking his life. He does it. It doesn't make sense to go hang out by a creek and let birds feed you, but he does it. And now God says, now you go to Sidon, the middle of Baal worship. And he does it. And what you see now is a pattern. What is your patterns with your relationship with God? What does it look like for you? What's your pattern? Do you have a pattern? Do you read the word of God consistently? Or is it something that you do in January when you get all excited about a new year and then in February it's like gone? Are you consistent in your prayer life? Do you have a time every day you spend a little time with, with the Lord? Is it a pattern? See, now we're observing Elijah's life and we begin to see a pattern in his life. And what is one of the overwhelming patterns of Elijah's life? Obedience. This guy has a pattern of obedience. He just does what God tells him to do. When God speaks, he obeys. When God speaks, he does it. That's what we see happening here. He obeyed consistently. Listen to what 2 Thessalonians 3.13 says in the New Testament. It says, as for you brothers, watch this, I love this. Do not grow weary in doing good. Why do you think the Bible encourages us to not grow weary in doing good? Because obeying God can become hard and tiresome sometimes. And so the Bible speaks to us. God speaks to us and says, look, I know sometimes you're going to get tired of obeying me, but don't grow weary in doing good. And I would say to you today, look, I want us to be long-term obedient Christians, not just flash in the pan. You know what I mean? Look, it's easy to work out and eat right for like a week. It's week two and three that, man, that gets really hard. Because I can do without Chick-fil-A for a week. But by week three, I'm like, I'm going to get that spicy Chick-fil-A sandwich right now. And if anyone gets in my way, you're going to get hurt. Week four, oh my goodness, man, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Long-term, consistent obedience is hard. That's what's hard. It's not week one. It's not... It's not the first day. The first day that Elijah got by the creek, it was probably like, this is kind of cool. The first day the ravens came in the morning, I don't know what a raven sounds like, but that's the closest thing I got. And when they come in, he's probably like, this is pretty amazing. But by day 78, it probably got old. By 78, he's probably like, how long am I going to sit here? How long am I going to have to stay here? And God's like, you don't move till I tell you to move. That gets hard after a while, right? I remember I used to hunt with uh, my grandfather a lot when I was a kid. And this one time we were by this river in a swamp we were hunting. He put me in a spot to hunt while he went somewhere else. He said, you don't move until I come back and get you. But I, you know, I got some attention issues, especially as a kid, all right? And so I was like, you know what, I'm just going to walk around a little bit. And do you know what's interesting about rivers and swamps? Every square inch of it looks the same. So here's what I did at 10 years old, 11 years old. I looked over there and I'm like, You know what? There's a tree right there, and that's the tree. The the, the thing I didn't think of is that there was 40 billion trees, right, by this river. And I thought, there's a tree and there's the river. I'll remember that. There's a tree by the river the whole way, no matter where I walk. And then it, it was in the afternoon, and as it got darker, everything began to change how it looked. And, man, I got lost out there, and I just had to yell for my granddad until he could find me. And he comes to me. What do you think he said? I told you to stay in that spot. And I'm like, I just wanted to walk around a little bit. Yeah, but I told you to stay there. It was hard for me. The first 30 minutes was fine. But minute 31, I was done. Long-term obedience is hard. But it is rewarding. 
And God says, you know what? If you will trust me, I will direct you and I will provide for you. So he does exactly what God says. And guess what? What God has promised is awaiting him. There is a widow. And don't forget that God tells Elijah, I've already spoken to her. There's some mystery about this. We don't know how God spoke to her. We don't know what kind of person she is. She lives in Sidon where Baal worship is happening. But evidently, this is one of the people that believes in the living God. She may not be strong in her faith, but at least she's not fully bought into Baal worship. And she hears from the living God, and she goes to get him some water. 1 Kings 17, 11 through 14 says, And as she was going to bring it, he called for her and said, Oh, also bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. <clears throat> and she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. That sounds pretty morbid, doesn't it? But don't forget what is going on in the entire region at this point. The famine is so bad now, the creeks are drying up, which means she doesn't have much water and she is out of food. Everyone's starving to death at this point. You're going to find out in next week that the horses... Ahab's own horses, the king's horses, are starving to death. That's how bad the famine is. It's really, really bad. So she has decided we're going to die. We're about to eat our last bit of food. And here comes Elijah going, well, I want a bite of that. I'd like you to bring me the last little bit of your water and the last little bit of your food. Watch this. Verse 13, Elijah said to her, do not fear and go and do as you have said. But first, everyone say first. But first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me and afterward make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour will not be spent and the jug of oil will not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. What is God teaching both Elijah and this woman at this point? It's the first thing's principle. Notice Elijah says to her, before you eat, You've got to obey God. Now Elijah is not only obeying God for himself, he's teaching others to obey. He's teaching this woman to obey. And what is God teaching her and us? If you will obey God first, he'll provide for you. But if you focus on you first, you are not going to unlock God's provisions in your life. So notice what Elijah says. Hey, God's going to feed you if you obey him first. Now, how could Elijah say that to her? Because God had already told him, I've told this woman to feed you. So Elijah knew that God had spoken to her. So he's saying to her, before you take care of you and your son, now watch what she's doing. She's doing what all of us do. We always hedge our bets with God. What we do is we go, God, I'll obey you as soon as I'm good to go. As soon as my retirement accounts are taken care of. As soon as I make sure we're comfortable. As soon as I get vacation paid for next year and make sure the house is paid for and all that. Then I'll, I'll, I'll get, you know, cut a little bit off the edge of my finances to do something for you, God. And it doesn't have to be financial. It can be in other ways. We hedge our bets. And we make sure that we're all covered. And then we go, okay, God, now what would you like me to do? And the Bible is very clear that God must be our priority. That we must say to God, God, we obey you first. Isn't this what Jesus taught us? In the book of Matthew, Jesus said in verses 33 of chapter 6, Jesus said, seek second the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. Is that, is that it? See, I'm acting, there was a time where I did, I, I was a church planter and we all took turns being the children's minister and the music minister at our little church plant. And there was one time a month, me and my wife would go do children's ministry. It was a lot of fun. And I would go in there and I would say, okay, today we're going to talk about Jonah and the ark and the kids would go no and I'd say well then who is it and they would tell me I'd say no 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 it's it, I, I, would, I would get them to answer back so that's what I'm doing with you right now is it seek second the kingdom of God no church it's seek first and all these things will be added to you isn't that right so what we see now is the seek God first principle and Elijah taught that woman that so now we see you can write it down that Elijah obeyed privately and publicly he didn't just obey by the creek. Now he's obeying in the middle of Sidon. And now what is he going to do? He's going to work a miracle. Look at 1 Kings 17, 15. So she went, did it as Elijah said, and she and her household ate for many days. Remember, there's just a little bit. 
The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. Isn't that awesome? Now I want you to think about this for a second. Why is God doing this? Watch. Everyone in Sidon, and now everyone in Israel, believes in this false god Baal, and they were taught that Baal could feed them. But everyone is starving to death. And they're all praying to Baal, and it's not raining, and nothing's growing, and everyone's dying. But now Elijah, the guy that publicly in front of the whole country in Sidon too said there's one living God and I know who he is, now shows up into Sidon, the epicenter of Baal worship, and the first miracle he works out of the gate with one woman and one little family is he multiplies food for them. What's that saying? It's saying to the whole country, your God has done nothing for you and while you're starving to to death, this living God, the God of Elijah, is showing you that he can make food out of nothing, that he can provide. Church, do you know what we need? If we're going to walk with God in a modern world, in a world that's questioning whether God even exists, the world's got to see that you and I believe in him, and we've got to show that our God, the living God, does provide. He does keep his promises. He is worth following. He is worth trusting. He is worth obeying. But we can't show the world that if we don't obey him. So Elijah was willing to let God platform him for the whole world to see. And lastly, I would say, and this is for us too, Elijah not only obeyed God himself, he's now teaching others to obey God. Elijah led others to obey God. He has taught this woman now what he had learned privately. He's going to teach many, many others. In fact, he's going to teach the whole nation how to obey God radically. He did it by example. He obeyed God himself. He does it by instruction. He tells her how to obey God. You obey God first, not second. And he also does it with understanding. Notice he does not scold the woman when the woman's like, I got to feed me and my son first. Look what he says. Look how kind he is. He says, hey, I know you're afraid. Don't be afraid. God's going to provide for you. Make mine first like God told you to do and watch what happens. Do you see? He doesn't scold her. He's kind. That's what we have to do. We have to obey God for everybody to see. Then we have to tell them how to obey God. And then we have to do it with grace. (coughs) Listen to what Matthew 28 says for our mission. As a church, excuse me. Go therefore and make disciples. Making disciples includes baptizing them, which we're going to do today. But look at verse 20. Teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. As our team comes, it's very important for us to understand that today. We must obey God and then teach others how to do it. And so my question today as we close this segment of Elijah, is there anything in your life that you're obeying God in second but not first? Is there any area of your life that you've said, I'm going to hedge my bets? Is there any area of your life where you are not walking in obedience? My prayer today is, by the grace of the gospel, that you would be obedient the way Elijah was obedient. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for your word and your truth, and I pray that you would use it to help us follow you more completely today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.